Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Welcome. Glad that you're here at Faith Bridge. If you're in Center Court West, if you're at the Woodlands, if you're online, however it is, we're glad that you're here. So we're going to go to Galatians in the New Testament. So why don't you turn in your Bibles to Galatians over there. And if you need a Bible, just uh, wave at one of the ushers coming in the aisles right now, and they'll be glad to let you borrow one. Or you can just keep it. It's our gift if you need a Bible. <clears throat> and don't be afraid to use the table of contents to find Galatians, because you got a few minutes before we're actually going to get there. So I wonder, um, you ever been around a newlywed couple? If you have, you know how just how the, there's just this buzz of love and excitement in the air, right? And they hold hands all the time, and they sneak a little wink at each other, and they say, I love you, and I love you, I love you more, and I love you more, you know, and it's just so sweet. And, but then something happens to every newlywed over time. Life. Life happens. Time takes on, and the couple's margins begin to uh, contract and be devoured by the increasing responsibilities of having, oh, I don't know, a mortgage, maybe some children, work to do, bills to pay, dishes to do, lawns to keep. And over time, where hearts of love and devotion were once in the front seat driving everything along in that relationship. Well, over time, all of the, the mundane chores, the functions of marriage have crawled over into the front seat, and many times it seems like they are driving the relationship now, which is why husbands and wives periodically work to rejuvenate their hearts, right? And to remember each other and to push into the backseat all of those mundane chores of marriage. And so, um, but I don't want to talk about marriage today. I want to talk about a different relationship. I want to talk about our relationship with God. Um, because unfortunately, as I've been pondering it, it's occurred to me that the same downward spiral from a relationship full of love into a functional, mechanical type of relationship, that can happen not only in marriage, it can happen in our relationship with God as well. Oh, now, when a person first trusts in Christ, when they first invite Jesus into their lives, it's like... Well, it's, it's like nothing else. Just the wonder that, that God would actually love me. Yes, me. And down a cross for me. The wonder of that is, is, is just, it's just marvelous. And to be around somebody who's new in the faith, it's so, it's so refreshing. It's so inspiring. It's kind of like a spiritual honeymoon. It's when... Many people tend to get their Bible for the first time or at least read it for the first time and maybe try some praying and actually see there's a correlation between when I pray and then there's these answers. What do you know? I think he's really here. Yeah, exactly. And many times they, um, they actually kind of get involved in church and maybe have a devotional time and, and meet with God on a regular basis. All the while they're just basking in this Knowledge that God loves them. But then something happens. Life. And that person begins to find himself, herself, starting to think less about God's amazing love. Yeah, it just began to sort of take it for granted. Yeah, I know he loves me. That's kind of old news. Sort of like husbands and wives can do with each other, right? And this type of Christian, well, he or she probably continues to go to church, uh, maybe not quite as regularly as they used to. 
or as expectantly to see God's hand work. And they might still have a devotional time, a quiet time here or there. But, you know, life is just so busy now. There's so much stuff I got to do. It's just hard to, to fit the spiritual stuff in anymore. You know how it is? When you get to that point, <laughs> your walk with the Lord is no longer sweeping you along like a, like a raft full of teenagers swept down the river's summer rapids. Nope. When you get to that point, your faith feels more like you're treading water in a warm, humid, stagnant pond in the dead of summer, wishing somehow that it could be refreshing, but it just doesn't feel so refreshing. It feels like drudgery. Oh, you know, many times that person will say, well, I, I know I should still go to church and be active, and I know I should have devotional time, and I, I ought to invite somebody to go to church. I know, I know, I know, but the more you inventory all those sorts of things that you're not doing, the more frustrated, discouraged that you begin to feel about it all. And what once started out as an exciting, vibrant relationship full of love for the Lord now has become dry. It's sort of just a going through the motions, a functional relationship with God that doesn't really make your heart beat fast anymore. And whether or not you ever articulate it, you can even start to resent God for, I don't know, kind of holding you captive to do the religious stuff that you probably wouldn't do otherwise, but for the fact that he does tend to hold a little bit of a trump card, and that trump card being the threat of eternal damnation. And that's a little bit of a trump card, right? Well, if you were here several weeks ago, you know that I was uh, very transparent with you, and I shared just straight from my heart about my own spiritual journey in the recent months, and about how, how over time I now realized that I had moved gradually out of a vibrant walk with the Lord, not even aware that this was happening, into a more perfunctory, dry, functional relationship, sort of just a going through the motions with God. I referred to it, if you weren't here, as sort of sleepwalking in my faith, sort of like my faith had just sort of kicked into autopilot, but it wasn't really stirring my heart anymore. And then I told you about how right around Easter, something began to happen. The Lord started to bring me out of this malaise and catapulting me into an all new place spiritually. And I'm telling you, he has been stirring me up ever since. And just doing so many wonderful things in my soul, so many answers to prayer, so many, just, it's just, it's an amazing thing. And so here I am, having come through this cycle of the soul that I've just described. And I wish I could tell you, it's the only time I've ever passed through that cycle, but it's not. The truth is I've gone through that cycle several times in my lifetime. But that has got me thinking, all right, this time around, <laughs> After, for crying out loud, by the time you're 50, shouldn't, and you've worked in a church for more than half your life, shouldn't you have figured out how not to keep going through that cycle of the soul again and again? Well, I do take some comfort in reading some of the great classics devotional writers, people like St. John of the Cross, they also attested to having their cycles of the soul and referred to them as things like the dark night of the soul. But I figured, since I'm on the top side of this cycle right now, I, I've decided I'm going to leverage everything I've got to trying to figure out what does one need to do to try to stay closer to that top side of the cycle of the soul? And I've concluded in searching for kind of what the, I don't know, essential components of renewal or revival, what those might be. I've concluded that there are two, that there's two things that are really 
essential, perhaps more, but at least these two. And today, I want to discuss the first, and next Sunday, I'll discuss the second. But the one for today, the one to which I would point when people say, so what do you attribute this, this sort of renewal of your soul to? This is what I'd point to. It's so, it's so simple. It's, really, it's so basic, but it's so good, and I want you to get it. I tell people, I feel like I've just gotten saved all over again. That's what I feel. I just feel like I've gotten saved all over again. Now, let me unpack that for a few minutes. First of all, by making clear, when I say I feel like I've been saved all over again, I don't mean I've literally gotten saved all over again, because I know that I know that I know that when I was in fourth grade, that's when I trusted in Christ. That's when I came into salvation through Jesus Christ, by grace through faith. It's just that, uh, I don't know, in the last month, I've been feeling the joy of that salvation again, almost as if I was back in fourth grade again. I suppose, suppose it's kind of like when a married couple goes on an anniversary getaway. They have a little trip, maybe go to a favorite place, maybe leave some of the chores and the functions of marriage behind for a few days. And in that time, they experience the joy of their marriage again. Something begins to spark again. And what had frozen up begins to thaw and grow warm once more. So their hearts are brought to life for each other. Well, I think similarly, spiritual revival is always directly related to the experiencing of one's joy, of one's salvation, to experiencing the joy of one's salvation again. So why, if this is the case, don't we just stay there. That'd be a good place to stay, right? Here's why. Because life happens. It beats us down, and as it does, we lose the wonder that our great God would actually love us just the way we are. And here's the danger in that. And this is what I'm driving at. I want to make sure that you get. When you lose the wonder of the joy of his love, of the joy of his salvation that he offers through Christ, you'll start to fall into the same trap that the Galatians found themselves falling into. This is what I want us to look at in Galatians chapter 3. I told you we were going to get there, and here's, here, here we are. Let me give you the context before I read it to you. You have to understand, the Apostle Paul, he was writing this letter to the, these Christians who were gathered, gathered in the, the city of Galatia, which was beneath the Black Sea in modern-day Turkey. And things had started out so well for them as they'd heard the gospel and trusted in good, the good news of Jesus and what he had done for them. It had started out so well, but things had gone south for them. South, because as that became sort of commonplace, oh yeah, Jesus loves me, God loves me, I know. Yeah. They became vulnerable to some heretics, uh, some imposters who slid in to the church, and they began to teach a different message. And they began to teach these Galatians, now, you thought you had all of the gospel. You thought you had all the good news, but you didn't. You didn't? No, you didn't. Let us tell you what you've been missing. Okay, we don't want to miss anything. What you've been missing is, don't you realize, you had to become Jewish before you'll be good enough to become a follower of Christ. Really? We got to become, Jesus never said that part of me. Well, I know, but, but trust us. You've got, to, you've got to come now, and you've got to do all of the, the things that Judaism required. And that's a lot of laws, and that's even some things that will affect your body. You're going to have to, to do those sorts of things to demonstrate the most practical signs of being Jewish. And the Galatian Christians, they were hearing this, and again, thinking, I don't think, I, well, okay, if that's, if that's what it takes, then let's do that. This is what Paul was writing to them about. Let's read him what he says in, in chapter 3, verse 1. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. 
I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? In other words, how did you first come into the faith, he's saying? Was it because of something that you did, something that you achieved? Or wasn't it just because you threw yourself at the love and the mercy and the trust of Jesus Christ? You threw yourselves into his arms and trusted in what he did for you on the cross. Verse 3, he says, are you so foolish that after beginning by means of the spirit, you're now trying to finish by means of the flesh? In other words, he's saying, are you really convincing yourselves that the gospel, the gospel was good enough to get us started but it's not enough to get us finished. It's not enough to get you finished. No, nope. now you got to come through with your end of the deal. Paul's saying, are you really that foolish? I mean, if Christ really came to live the sinless life of perfection that you couldn't live so that he could die the death of punishment that you deserve so that he could conquer the grave and rise victoriously and sweep you into that that resurrection into that life. What part of that is incomplete? What part of that wasn't enough? What part of that beckons you to say, well, I know what you did for me, God, was enough to get me started, but it's, I know. I know it's not enough to, to get the job finished. I know. I know. Now, God, I know that I've got to come through with my end of the deal. I know there's a catch in this deal. Grace gets us started, but now it's up to me. And I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you through all the religious things that I do. And I'm going to be so good. And I'm going to be so faithful. I'm going to show you that I'm worth the saving. And Paul says in verse 6, I'm astonished that you are so quickly departing the one deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ, and you're turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Gospel means good news. He says, why are you getting distracted by all the, the, these religious chores and functions these people have told you you have to, when you already had all the good news that you could have ever asked for or received? If you had to earn his love and his forgiveness by your good works, by your good actions. Trust me, that would not be good news, Paul is saying. That would just be like any other world religion. Do you really want to just be like another hamster crawling into that wheel in the cage and just starting to run and faster and faster and faster as if somehow one day you'd go fast enough and God would say, now that is really good. I'm going to go ahead and let you come on in because you're doing it so good. Do you really think that's possibly how it could work? No, Paul is saying. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm not basking in the amazing good news of God's love for me, I am tempted to get distracted and to start thinking thoughts like the Galatians. You know why? Because if just even a little bit of my salvation could, could depend upon my merits, my works, my actions, my morals, honestly, it'd make me probably feel a little bit better about the outcome because I'm a control freak. And I like to know that, you know, I'm kind of in control of how things are going to come out. Plus, everything else in my life, and yours as well, has always correlated to things that I've earned or done or accomplished, right? It starts back in childhood. I remember when I was a child, and you had this experience too. You, uh, they counted up how many spelling words I got correct on the test every Friday. And then they counted up how many A's I got and how many B's I got and so on. And, and then when you get older, they, 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 they start keeping tabs. They start tallying how much money that you're earning. And as you get older yet, you've got to start tallying how many pounds you, you've been gaining so that then you can tally up how many pounds you need to start losing, right? And so all of life, it just never stops. It's all about tallying and measuring and working for whatever that we get. And that's why Martin Luther said 500 years ago, our hearts are hardwired for works righteousness. The idea that 
whether God loves us must surely be determined by what we do, by what we accomplish. But that's not the gospel. And it is exhausting. But it has nothing to do with what Jesus ever said. It's, that's not good news. By the way, what is the good news? What is the gospel? It's this. That God so loved the world that he sent Jesus to live that life you couldn't live and die that death you deserved to rise victorious. What's the gospel? The gospel is all about the fact that you and I are saved by his grace through putting our trust, our faith in him, that it's a gift from him. It doesn't correlate to anything we ever did. He loves you just because he loves you. And it has nothing to do with anything you ever accomplished, past, present, or future. In a nutshell, the gospel is to borrow from another person, that there's nothing that you could do that would ever make him love you more, and there's nothing you've ever done that could make him love you less. And the reason it's called good news is because it doesn't really make sense. Think about it. Does it make sense that a God who is perfect, who is holy, who has no sins whatsoever, would look down upon the likes of you and me and just love us? That he would love you, that he would love me just the way we are? Heck, I don't even love you or me the way that we are, right? Does it make sense that our perfect God would have the patience and the bandwidth and the love in his heart for us that way. No, it doesn't compute. This is why we're so prone to slipping into the mindset, not unlike the Galatians. And it's why Jesus kept on telling stories to try to help us understand. <laughs> you don't understand. He's a good, good father. That's who he is. Jesus said, it's sort of like this. Suppose the father had two sons, and one of those sons, he was really good and obedient and all that sort of stuff. And, and so you think, okay, so he's like the favored child, and he's going to win in the end, right? Right? No, nope, that's not right. What's, what happens? Because there was this other brother, and he was a scoundrel. He was a bad son. He was selfish. He was self-consumed. He said, give me all my money. Give me my inheritance. He went off. He wasted it all. And he ends up with nothing. And you expect at that point that the Lord's going to say, and the father showed him and rewarded the good son. That's not what he says. No, he says, that's not the heart of our father. It's not? No. So how's the story end, Jesus? Well, here's how the story ends. If the father were just to see even on the farthest horizon that that scoundrel son of him, his had come to his senses and turned around and said, you know what, I'll just go home. I'll just ask, can I be a servant? I won't even ask to be a son anymore. I'll just be a slave. Even if he barely saw him coming over the horizon, Here's how good our father is. He would take off running towards that son. He'd wrap his arms around him. He'd throw his robe around him. He'd bring him back in. He'd announce, strike up the band. Let's have a feast. My son was lost, but now he's found. Because he's a good, good father. Doesn't make any sense. But that's who he is. In another place, Jesus said, oh, He's such a good father that if a, if a kiddo ever came along and said, Father, could I have some bread? Would he give that child a stone? Here, kid, munch on this. No, he's not going to do that. Or if a child asked for a fish, would he say, here, try this serpent. See how you like that? No. He'd give him fish, not a snake. Why? Because he's a good, good father. So last week, um, I was uh, talking with uh, some friends who uh, 
Suzanne and I have been spending a little extra time with lately. And um, one of the ladies, she and her husband, we've been getting to know a little bit better. And I'll just describe her saying, if you were to see her, you would say, oh, she's pretty. Y yes, she's pretty on the inside, but she's pretty on the outside. Suzanne and I have commented, she's really cute. But as we've gotten to know them, we've come to understand she's never been able to see herself the way the rest of us see her because she's always been sort of a victim of this, this uh, bad, destructive uh, self-image, self-talk, body-shaming kind of stuff. In fact, it led her into anorexia, and by the time she was in college, she tells us that it, it, she had to go to the hospital for like a month or two. She'd gotten down, so she was almost, she almost, it almost killed her. But lately, she's been getting to know this good, good father of ours. She joined a small group, and she's been growing and, and starting to read her Bible and learning more about who he really is and how much he really loves her. And so, and this past week, she, she said, I had a God sighting. That's just our little handle for where did you see God's hand maybe work in your life or maybe an answer to prayer or something. She said, I have a God sighting. I had a God sighting this week. I said, oh, good. What was your God sighting? She said, well, this past week, for the first time, I, I looked in the mirror, and for just a moment, I saw myself the way our Heavenly Father sees me. Well, the room was hushed, because we had all heard her talk openly about the struggles that she had had. And so finally, I said, so you were able to see yourself the way our Father sees you? She teared up. She said, I was. Unable to say anything more, I kind of helped her at that point. I said, okay, so if that's what you just experienced, then that must mean you looked in the mirror and you actually saw yourself as beautiful and precious. Is that it? She said, I did. For just a moment, I did. I thought, oh, he's a good, good father. Now, I know that many of us who are men, we hear that illustration, and, and it doesn't really do much for us, because we tend to look in the mirror and go, yep, I still got it. And, and uh, <laughs> but you know, when one of my boys sins, when one of my boys acts up, uh, I'll tell you what, it, it saddens me, it sometimes even maddens me, but it never changes my love for him. It never changes our relational status, right? Because I'm still his father and he's still my son. Now, in those moments of rebelliousness, in those moments of hard-headedness, our fellowship may cool off a tad, but my love for him doesn't change. And like I said, he's still my son, even when he sins. And I've realized, even though it doesn't make sense, nothing he ever does makes me lose my love for him. I keep on loving him. Oh, now, there's plenty that he can do to drive me a little crazy, to disappoint me, to make me upset, to make me angry. But even then, at the end of the day, I still love him. And I can't help myself. And Jesus said, if you who are evil, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, then just think how much more our Father in heaven knows how to give the same sorts of gifts and love to you. I'm telling you, if you could let his love, <laughs> if you could let that soak into your soul, I'm telling you, it would change everything about your outlook. Now, I know, I know some of you right now, you're thinking, okay, well, 
Pastor Ken, this is like so uh, basic, you know, uh, that God loves me and, and the gospel. And I know the gospel. I can tell the gospel to anybody. You know, Jesus came and he died and he rose and trust him. And I, I know that. Yeah, see, I did too. And that's the problem with where I was a couple of months ago. And I just have a sneaking suspicion it's the problem that many of you are having in your own spiritual journeys right now. See, many of us, we know this good news. We know it up here. The problem is we don't still remember it down here. And when it happens to you that way, I'm telling you, what begins to happen is you begin to sleepwalk in your faith at that point. You still cling to doctrinal truth at least for a while, until you start getting lulled over by the Galatians. You keep plodding through life with hardly a thought, though, about his overwhelming love and his goodness for you. And there's a world of difference between understanding it and experiencing it. If you're experiencing the love of Jesus Christ afresh in your heart, you'll get the benefits. I'll tell you one of the big benefits that I've discovered. It, it, you find it in 1 John chapter 4. In John chapter 4, he said an interesting thing. He said, <clears throat> when God's love is shed abroad in your heart, well, that's Romans 5.5, 5, but when it's shed abroad in your heart, something will happen. You will not experience fear because perfect love casts out all fear. And I've noticed in my own journey this last month how peaceful I've been, how much less anxious and fearful and neurotic that I've been. And, and you know, if you've reduced him to just being sort of a cerebral doctrinal concept that there's this great God and he loves me and you know that so well, but you're not experiencing it, I'll tell you what will happen. That fear, that anxiety, that neuroticism, that impatience, that frustration, all of that starts closing in on you and you will start to be consumed by all of those sorts of things. You'll get consumed by yourself, by your appearance, by your performance. You'll be consumed by your child's appearance and performance. And why? Because you're always going to be looking around. If you're not looking to him, you're looking to someone else for your cues. You're looking to see, how do I benchmark against him? How about her? How about them? How am I doing? Am I doing enough? Am I working harder? And you've stepped off of that platform of grace onto that treadmill of having to do it yourself. And the sad thing about it, about it is, you begin to convince yourself, God must think the same sorts of thoughts that I'm thinking right now. So I better try harder. This is the problem. And all the while, you could have stayed caught up in the wonderful, reassuring safety of sitting in his presence. Just letting your heavenly father put his arms around you and love you. The very God of the universe hold you. And whisper into your ears his words of affirmation and satisfaction. And I'm telling you, that can change your whole outlook and your, your whole self-image. Now, once again, you'll be no less his child if you've put your trust in him. If you hop right on out of his lap and you say, well, I'm just going to go on my way now, you'll not cease to be his child, but this will happen. The busier that you get, the further away from him you move, the cooler your heart will grow, the more distracted you'll become and captured by all the things that are going on around you. And all that fear and anxiety and nervousness and comparison, all of that will start to encroach and control your hearts again. Because you got to look somewhere. So you'll look at them instead of your loving father. And consequently, 
you'll end up feeling eh, discouraged about your faith, like it's kind of on autopilot. You'll end up exhausted, frustrated, irritable, sometimes even a little suspicious about God, who never wanted anything more than your heart so that he could love you. Oh, I'm telling you, there is nothing like the Father's love. Let it soak in. Let it soak in again and again, day after day, morning after morning. Just ponder it. Because I'm telling you, if you will let his love soak deeply into your soul, you will feel just like you got saved all over again. And there's nothing like it. It's what I want for you. James 4.8 says, draw near to him, and he will draw near to you. So in these final moments of our service, I want to invite you to draw near to him and his heart. We're going to spend a few minutes just communing with him. You'll remember that the night that Jesus was betrayed. He took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body and it's broken for you. And then he took the cup and he said, this is my blood poured out for you. And he said, I want you to, I, when you come together, I want you to take this. Because as you do, it's like my body and blood. And you're just, you can't take this without remembering how much I love you. And so as we come and take the um, the gluten-free wafer and you dip it into the grape juice and you partake, I want to invite you just to let him shed his love abroad in your heart once again. Just like the first time perhaps you ever experienced that love. Let him do it all over again today. After I pray, the ushers in all, both our rooms will just lead you, and you can come to one of the stations, and you can partake. And if you want to kneel, uh, as a lot of folks did in the first hour, and just spend a little time uh, praying on the steps or up front, you can just spend as much time as you want. The musicians will be leading us. We'll just be singing some songs of the faith to the Lord. And if you'd like someone to pray with you, you just maybe hold out your hands uh, sort of, like this, and then our prayer partners in the red shirts will know to draw near to you, and they'd be happy to, to hear your request and, and pray with you about that. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much. You are a great God. You're a loving Father. You beckon us, come near to me, because I want to come near to you. Forgive us, Lord, for how often we turn you into some sort of gotcha, uh, bait and switch ogre in the sky. We find ourselves moving from a platform of grace to a position of having to work and run in that treadmill over and over and faster and faster. And no wonder our faith begins to just feel so flat, uninspiring. Oh, we might even still believe the right things and say the right things, but we're not feeling it anymore. Lord, my prayer is today that you'd help us to experience the joy of our salvation, just like it was the very first time. And if any are here who have not ever trusted in Christ in the first place, Lord, help them to feel the joy of their salvation for the first time, even today. Friend, you could just... As you come up to the table, you just invite him with Jesus. I'm inviting you to come into my heart today because I want you to forgive me and I want you to live inside of me through your spirit and I want you to give me a new life. Teach me what it means to follow after you. So Lord, won't you meet with us in these moments of communing? We pray all these things in your strong name, Jesus. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. 
Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi, and welcome to Postscript. I'm Luann Riley, Grow Group and Discipleship Director here at FaithBridge, and I'm here with founding pastor Ken Worline, who just talked to us about reawakening and re revival in our souls. You're talking about this soul cycle yeah. uh, that, uh, as believers, you mentioned you've been through several times yeah. that you can, you can look back through. Um, and we're talking about how you feel now at this stage of your cycle, which is this joy mm -hmm. of experiencing the newness and freshness. The that, joy of my salvation. Yes, the joy of your salvation. Um, and so I just have a couple questions yep. um, about that. Um, so as you mentioned, you can look back and see the cycle. And we saw in the Galatians kind of the, the cycle that they had gotten into and they were like, no, the gospel is alive and it's supposed so much bigger than this. And, yep. and so you're in that cycle now. And so I wonder though, is it possible to stay there mm. what i mean is it possible to continue experiencing that joy all the time without cycling back or mm -hmm. is that like a mountaintop experience that that mm -hmm. just comes and goes yeah. uh, well how do we stay there yeah uh, ask me in a few months right i would like to think that one can stay there longer than most of us do. Mm. Um, I don't know that we can stay there all the time because there is a waxing and a waning to the soul and to f feelings and even physiologically, um, you know, as endorphins are released when we're having, you know, times of excitement and, mm -hmm. and love and, you know, you, finally you're, endocrine system even has to, to correct and you kind of have to go down a little bit. And so I don't know if it's altogether possible. I do think it is probably possible for us to go further with it and more frequently than most of us in America, Chris, American Christianity are accessing. Mm -hmm. Why? Because I think, like I preached about, I think so many of us are, are just prone to letting um, the other things of life crowd out mm. the Lord. And wh what has your mind has you. And if you give your mind over to those things, then it only uh, naturally follows that uh, things are going to begin to grow cooler in your soul. Um, so what do we do? Well, I think uh, certainly we utilize the the spiritual uh, disciplines or the mm -hmm. tools that we talked about back in January, prayer and Bible study and, and these sorts of things. Um, even there though, I think we can fool ourselves, mm -hmm. right? Because, y you know, I, I, I'll speak for myself. Uh, there's m plenty of times that I have hastily read my Bible verses for the day, maybe written something down in my journal, uh, maybe jotted down a few thoughts, uh, prayers and such, and then jump up on my way. Where if I had listened to the Lord and tarried a few minutes longer, I think a couple of things would have happened. I think I would have heard him say, you're not really surrendered mm -hmm. to me. Not yet you're not. And yet in my own mind, I was like, I had my quiet time. I met with the Lord, on I go, because I got stuff I got to do. I think the second thing that would happen, because uh, I've certainly experienced this over the years, is, is that he would surprise me along the way with serendipitous um, things that make my busy list of things to do grow smaller. Mm. I never cease to be amazed with how when I do pull aside with him, spend time with him, I'm still able to get the stuff done that I need to get done. I just get there at the end of the day with a fuller tank mm. and a fuller heart yeah. um, with love for him. I think though of all the spiritual disciplines perhaps that we need to access in this effort to um, uh, 
maintain the spiritually vibrant soul. I think uh, community is probably the most important. Why? Because even as I just illustrated, if I don't have a person to confess that to, or to even ask me, so you? Ken, how is your walk with the Lord? How are the times that you're spending? Talk, talk about what you've been, you know. Now, the moment somebody asks me that, if I'll be honest and not perfunctory, and, oh, they're great, everything's good, let's get on to business. If I'll be real and say, well, you know, I don't know that I've really been drawing near to the Lord. As James 4, 8 says, draw near to him and he'll draw near to you. I don't think I've been drawing near. I think I've just been sort of checking it off. What is the corrective? Well, community. To have a brother, to have a sister, to have several who would ask one, me, that from time to time. And let's, you know, uh, experience the benefits from the opposite direction. Let's suppose several months from now, my soul, the, 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 the fire or whatever, has adjusted uh, not into a malaise, but just into a, uh, we'll call it a more normative s state. If I'm in community with another brother uh, or two and hear one of them talk about what God's doing in their lives, mm -hmm. that could very well likely uh, relight my mm -hmm. fire again. Yeah. And so it goes both directions, doesn't it? Community is is... And that's why, of course, the authors of Scripture were always calling us back, you know, to, let's not forsake the fellowship together, uh, you know, because uh, we got to spur one another along um, in this thing. Because if you're running uh, alongside somebody and you're feeling tuckered out and you're like, I think I'm just tired of it, they can say, no, 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 let's keep going. We're doing it. We're, do, you know, and to have somebody who's running that race of faith alongside of us. Um, I think we. Simple. I mean, we're seeing the. We are seeing that in our groups now of groups who have come and said we've had the discussion. Where what's the, everyone share? What's the yeah. state of your soul? Are yeah. you in revival? And and people yeah. feeling um, authentic and safe place to confess or acknowledge yeah. Yeah. I'm not there, even though I might be appearing yeah. to be. I'm not. And yeah. then to be excited for the people who are, and how many people have come forward since you shared about your revival, just yeah. on fire for things that God's showing to yeah. them Amen. and in their life. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, community. And I'll just add on to that, just to illustrate more, since I've been uh, sharing just straight from my own life and soul the last few times. As I retrace things that I talked about the last time, several weeks ago, um, with the exception of my sermon preparation that day for Easter, where there was nobody around, it was just me calling out to the Lord, and he used his word. Take that out. The other things that happened, I mentioned that conversation that I had with Ben, who spoke words that something lit. Um, even going on a trip, uh, flying uh, with our own Justin on the airplane, where I, I found myself saying some things that I'd been thinking, but something about just saying them aloud and hearing him say them back. And, uh, our, you know, there was something was lit in, in my soul even through that. Mm. And so uh, I really do think this community thing is so integral to the vibrant soul. Okay, so even while we've been here doing postscript, we had another question come in. And I think it's an important question. Um, so I wanna make sure that we address it. So uh, they wrote in and said that the message today was wonderful and reassuring, but also confusing for them. They were raised Catholic. Mm -hmm. And so the message they heard was the idea of completing tasks and stages and do not sin. Mm -hmm. And so the question that they're asking is, if he loves us no matter what, what pushes us not to sin? Other than the commandments, how do we decide? Ah, uh, yeah, and that's a great question. Mm -hmm. I think that's one that, that lots of us wrestle with. Um, I think the questioner, um, I appreciate the, the transparency mm -hmm. saying, you know, here's how I was raised and this is what I was taught. Um, the only thing I can say to, to that is that is the Galatian heresy. Um, that the questioner picked up. 
that you've got to do all this stuff, stay in line and be good and don't sin and be perfect and all this kind of stuff. Um, that's not the gospel. Unfortunately, there are churches and um, right here and right mm -hmm. now that are still perpetuating that message. That's not what Jesus ever said. But the, but the question then uh, is, so what propels us to do the right thing? Mm -hmm. If you're saying he loves me, then I might just like sit around. Well, and people were saying the very same thing to the Apostle Paul. Mm -hmm. And um, he had to tell them, uh, you know, in fact, in one instance in Romans, they're asking him, uh, if that's the case, then we should just go ahead and sin all the more mm -hmm. uh, so that we just get more, more grace. grace. And Paul says, no, 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 that's folly. That's silly. That's like saying to your spouse, if you really love me, love me, love me, then I'll go out and have adultery. And you'll still love me, but that, no, see, but what, how could you do that? If you're really feeling loved and you're pouring that love back, what is it that causes you to stay faithful? It's your love. Mm -hmm. And so it is in our walk with Christ, what keeps us um, uh, in line or on track as the questioner says, it's the fact that we've been loved, mm -hmm. that, He's touched our heart and we're like, wow, how could I have done the things I've done and why would I ever do those again? Because I've been touched by an incredible love and uh, forgiveness and I want to go with him and I want to pursue him, not mm. these other things. Yeah, our love, his love for us, us. and our love for for him that motivates us. Yeah. Um, so you told us today that there were two things that you were gonna talk about. Yep. And today you talked about uh, one. That's right. And you said you would talk about the second one <laughs> next week. Can what you give us it? a little yeah, bit on the second I will. one? Okay, so what next week we're gonna talk about is the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. The power of the Holy Spirit um, touching us. Mm -hmm. And uh, which is always a fun conversation to have um, brings its share of questions along, but I think we'll be able to uh, n navigate some of those. And it's gonna be a powerful day. We're gonna ask the Holy Spirit to come and to give us all a mm -hmm. fresh touch. Um, so I'm looking forward to it. All right, I'm looking forward to that one too. Thank you for a great message and thank you for joining us back here for Postscript. We'll see you next week. Thanks for joining us for Postscript.